Hello, my name is Stephen Vono with NAPLIA. With me is my associate, Alex Swan, who will be administrating today's webinar. I'd like to welcome our guests, including Thomas Schran of Lockton. Thank you for participating in NAPLIA's Cybersecurity and the Clouds with Eric Hess, Managing Counsel at Hess Legal Counsel, and Raj Bakru, Founder and CEO of Aponix Financial Technologists. Eric Hess has over 15 years of experience acting as Senior In-House Counsel, General Counsel, or Senior Management for Exchanges, Broker-Dealers, and Financial Service Technology Providers. His experience includes creating legal, compliance, and technology operational risk management functions, designing compliant trading technology, advoca advocating for regulatory change, closing transactions, managing regulatory inquiries and investigations, and facilitating company growth both organically and through strategic transactions. Mr. Hess holds Series 7 and 24 licenses and is admitted to practice in the states of New York and New Jersey. Rock Bakru is the Chief Executive Officer of Aponix Financial Technologists, a firm focused on independent technology risk assessments and advisory for, firm, for financial firms. Before co-founding Aponix, Raj led the firm-wide software development and was part of the founding team at Kepos Capital, now a two billion global macro quantitative asset manager. He also held roles at Highbridge Capital and Goldman Sachs Asset Management. Raj is an alumnus of Columbia University. Eric, Raj, welcome and take it away. Great. Thanks a lot, Steve. Uh, this is for everyone's benefit. This is Russ Bakru, and just to attune you to our voices, um, I'll let Eric, Eric uh, say hi as well. Hello. This is Eric Hess. So uh, good afternoon. I appreciate you all joining our call. We're excited to, to hopefully provide you with some informative and helpful content on cybersecurity and where your firm should be positioned and thinking about um, and especially with regards to cloud and cloud security. Um, up here you can see our, our agenda right now. Please uh, message us if you're having any issues seeing the slides, but I, I believe everyone uh, said they were able to actually see them. To start, we'd like to, to provide some definitions and a little background, discuss why cybersecurity is a problem and what the trends are that we've been seeing. Um, and then we'll talk about some specific issues around mobile computing and the cloud uh, before we dive into what your firm can be doing, uh, what protections it can be putting in place and how to implement those, as well as what your firm should be doing in terms of breach response and planning, which is a, a big piece of this. So just to dive into definitions very quickly, because not, not everyone really understands what cybersecurity is. Um, it's not very well defined. I think we all just intuitively understand that, you know, it's the idea that your data or systems can be lost, corrupted, or compromised. And uh, underneath that, I think we all realize that that's generally due to malicious actions. So that might be hackers or, or you know, some, some uh, insider who has some malicious intent and is trying to cause harm to your firm. That's actually part of a broader concept, which is technology risk. Technology risk, you know, expands on this in that sometimes events happen with your technology that are not necessarily malicious. Um, if you think about something like Hurricane Sandy in the Northeast region taking down a lot of critical infrastructure. We had you know, data centers that were flooded and telcos that were flooded. Um, it was a huge test of resiliency for firms. That's a, a common example of where there was no malicious action unless you think the powers that be up there are, are malicious, uh, causing Hurricane Sandy. So who are these people? Who are these malicious actors that we keep talking about? Um, there's generally four, four types out there. The first is, you know, the financial cyber criminals that are out there to, to, you know, for financial gain. They're looking to make money. And that might be either by stealing money directly or by stealing data and selling that data. And that's, that's sort of what you commonly see with credit card uh, stealing or social security number stealing. They're able to go to the black market and sell that data for, you know, maybe a dollar per credit card or a few dollars per uh, social security number. You also have the hacktivists out there. And hacktivists are, are pretty much ideologically driven. Uh, so they have sort of their own philosophies and goals, and sometimes that's counter to uh, your firms and largely, you know, 
we've seen we've seen hacktivists out there that generally dislike the financial industry altogether. Um, some of that, you know, stems from the crisis and, and the bad reputational damage that was done then. So the hacktivists are out there to to sort of take down firms to to promote their own cause. And that's where you a lot of the times you see sort of your your 13 year olders in a garage just trying to you know cause harm and or uh, you know brag to their friends about breaking into a financial firm. You have your state sponsored actors, and these tend to be the ones targeting your big banks. So things like you know, people attacking JP Morgan was something on the news. Um, that's probably something that's less of a concern for most of the folks on this call. You're generally not having someone in, in uh, you know, the Middle East targeting your firm. And then you have the insiders, and the insiders are uh, your own employees that may just want to keep their own prior data or work, and in doing so, they're stealing intellectual property. Um, or they might be disgruntled and looking to damage or steal from the firm. And we've seen cases, for example, where People have destroyed network equipment or data on departure um, just to cause damage to, to their firm because they didn't like what they were being paid, for example. So we ran through some examples in that talk of, of cyber threats. There's plenty more. Um, distributed di denial of service attacks are becoming very, very common. We'll talk a little bit about ransomware and some examples of ransomware. Identity threat is, is, is rampant. Uh, and you know, generally, cyber threats can happen anywhere. It could be on, on your home desktop or laptop and infiltrate the firm there. It could be on mobile devices, and it could be in your cloud services. So just to give a little bit of history, um, you know, why, why is this an issue that we're all concerned about nowadays? And on the left, we have some examples where there aren't necessarily any malicious actors involved, so they fall under the technology risk category. And on the right, we have a lot of the the media around cybersecurity events. And a lot of these you guys obviously heard about on the news. We have some examples that are more recent than what we have listed here. We had Home Depot, uh, for example, maybe two or three weeks ago, and that was a bigger event than even the target breach in terms of credit cards being stolen. We had uh, Edward Snowden, and regardless of your views around Snowden, he was a system administrator who uh, walked out of the NSA with confidential proprietary data, and that's in effect, a, a data breach. Uh, we'd have, we had multiple financial firms where data has been stolen, you know, whether that be HSBC or Goldman Sachs or Two Sigma. We've seen a number of examples of that. We'll talk a little bit about CryptoLocker. We've seen the Federal Reserve hack, credit cards stolen all over the place. Um, so obviously, cybersecurity is a very, very big and growing issue. There are some, as we said, issues uh, that, that don't necessarily involve malicious intent. So if you think over to the Gun Allen Reg SP case back in 2011, uh, they had a few laptops stolen, um, or uh, yes, yeah, stolen, and there was actually no intent to to steal the data on those laptops. They were probably just selling the laptops for their own benefit. Uh, but that that turned into a large case of, you know, how did the firm protect their data? Um, this was a relatively small firm. You know, they they had a lot of uh, personally identifiable information, PII, that, that we're going to talk about a good bit. And they didn't take the necessary precautions or have the right documentation in place to, to protect um, their clients. We've seen other examples out there, as I mentioned, for Hurricane Sandy, but also things like uh, fat finger trades causing huge swings in individual stocks or in markets. And that can happen to anyone. Uh, even the flash crash, not a lot of people realize, was actually caused by a mutual fund sending a very, very large order pre-market, uh, where their system should have told them that this market, this order is too big for market. You don't want to do this, um, and that's that's sort of an example of a technology risk, not having the right tool in place to warn you of that. So, one of the main problems when it comes to dis having these kinds of discussions regarding cybersecurity is awareness. A lot of organizations view cybersecurity as something that impacts very large firms or, or that when they are attacked, they'll know it. Uh, the fact of the matter is that most organizations have had a data breach over the last two years, 78%. But for example, particularly among the small firms, they tend to view the large firms as being the target and don't think that they are themselves a target. For example, in a recent, very recent survey done by the North American Security Administrators Association, found that only 41% thought that they had ever been uh, exposed to a cyber or a breach, a cybersecurity incident or a breach. If you look to the left, there's a much higher percentage. 
And a lot of the problem stems from the fact that the smaller organizations really don't have the tools to detect whether or not they've been subject to the breach. It's kind of like asking somebody to make a determination whether they need to go to the dentist for a cavity. If they don't know they have a cavity, they don't go to the dentist. Um, and, and the problem with that is, is that we are seeing um, a lot more movement toward um, attacks targeting smaller firms. Uh, there's greater sophistication, greater targeting, and that makes the, the amount of effort to, um, to target a small firm uh, less and, and the potential reward that much greater. So when you look at the, the causes of breaches, another thing to keep in mind is that you know, 29% are the result, of, I'm sorry, 37% are the result of malicious attacks. But there is a, a very large portion that could be attributable to inadvertent breaches uh, relating to just pure negligence, where somebody inadvertently discloses the information because they're not used to the systems uh, or, or they inadvertently disclose it via the web or elsewhere. And there's also system glitches that could cause a large amount of uh, proprietary information to get released. Um, Another thing to keep in mind in all of this is when we talk about malicious uh, attacks or, or uh, you know, the, the spear phishing attack, which is where basically uh, a malicious actor gets, uh, sends emails out targeted to individuals in an effort to get them to respond, and then the, the uh, malicious program is uploaded, these attacks have, are actually up. Uh, from 2012 to 2013, targeted campaigns were up 91%. That's effectively a 10 times increase, which is huge. However, and this is a very telling statistic, the average number of emails sent for each of these campaigns was down 76%. Down 75% in the number of emails, up 10 times in the number of campaigns. And why is this? Because the attackers have become more sophisticated in using social engineering in other words, they're determining what people are more likely to respond to. They're getting more targeted in how they reach out to specific people to find ways into an organization. Another area that we're seeing a lot of is watering hole attacks, which is uh, where legitimate websites get hacked um, for the purposes when others go to them, they, uh, they have malware installed. I'll tell you personally, about a year ago, I uploaded a case from the CFTC website and attached to that, that matter was a malicious program. It was stunning because you would think a governmental entity wouldn't have that, and my computer was infected as a result of that. Um, so what does all this really mean? It means that in addition to thinking about the threat of malicious actors, we also have to think about the internal threat. And you know, at, in the diagram here, there's a number of different ways where this can occur. Improper equipment disposal, loss and missing equipment can account for up to 30% of these, these breaches of data. Uh, inadvertent web disclosures, snail mail, you know, email, uh, all these things can, can result in, uh, in breaches of your uh, information security. So the point being is that you know, when, when approaching cybersecurity, it's important to approach it from ensuring that bad actors don't get in, but also being very aware that perhaps the, the, the greatest uh, area to be focused on is your own employee's behavior, often legitimate behavior, and how that could potentially expose your company to, um, to, to, to a, a, an information security breach. An example of this, and this is actually a huge, huge example throughout the industry, was CryptoLocker. Um, as a bit of background for those of you who aren't familiar with CryptoLocker, CryptoLocker is a new type of malware. It's a, it's a type called ransomware. And the idea behind ransomware is that the malware is going to try to extort your firm for, for something. It's out there to uh, you know, basically bribe you to get something. Um, in the case of CryptoLocker, it entered firms through phishing attacks. So as Eric mentioned, these targeted phishing uh, spoofed emails, uh, the number of them are up. And CryptoLocker is, is an example of a malware that, would, that entered through these attacks. On the right, you can see an example of one of the emails that CryptoLocker entered with, and it's a fake FedEx confirmation email. There's a zip file attached to it, and if you open that zip file and open the file inside the zip file, all of a sudden you have this malware. What this malware did, um, in the case of CryptoLocker, was reach out to all of the files that you as a user had access to, whether that be on a network drive, on a shared drive, on your local computer, or your laptop, wherever you were. Um, it would basically find all those files, and encrypt them with a password. 
and that password would only be revealed to you if you paid, um, in, in the case of this example, $300, but we've seen examples that go to you know, 300 Bitcoin or uh, some, some monstrous numbers. The idea was if you don't pay it within three days, then uh, you're, you're going to lose access to all of your files. And this, start, this brings into question you know, the, the backups that you have in place and whether you can restore back to some kind of reasonable backup. Were your backups accessible to you and did they get locked with the same uh, password mechanism as, as your regular files? Um, all sorts of, of resiliency and, and operational concerns. We know everyone from you know, one of the uh, mothers of the COOs that we work with at a hedge fund got it all the way to a $20 billion hedge fund that got this and was out for you know, a matter of an hour or two while they tried to, to recover. And the real issue here is not you know, the $300 payment, it's the what could they have done had they realized they entered a financial firm. Uh, very you know, quickly off the bat, some things that, that that malware could have done is one, steal all the data, just send it off to some server off in Russia that no one will ever get access to um, and start selling that data. And all of a sudden, that brings into account you know, all of the breach response, the notification laws, what do you tell your clients, um, things like that. That's a huge business risk for most of the, most of the folks on the call. Um, it could have done far more damage in terms of, of the systems. It could have literally just taken down all of the systems that that user had access to. Or uh, it could have actually done something more sophisticated and just uh, lied you know, laid, laid there trying to gather information. And that goes into sort of the new types of malware that we're seeing nowadays, which are advanced pers persistent threats or APTs. The idea behind an APT is that it's going to install this malware on your systems. It's going to try spread throughout the systems in your, in your network, um, attacking uh, vulnerabilities in, in uh, the software that you have installed across your network, whether that be default passwords on routers or out-of-date Javas or Acrobats or missing Windows patches. Um, it will spread throughout your network. And then it will just sit there and gather information slowly, transmitting that back at some point to the threat actor. The threat actor can then orchestrate a, a larger attack using this network that they've, they've created within your firm, or they can sell that data or do any, any sort of destructive active action with this data. And the really hard part about APTs is that um, they become so, so advanced now that they're not a signature that antivirus software can very easily detect. They can mutate themselves and hide from antivirus software and malware software. So they can be very, very difficult to, to detect. And there are some examples where you know, they've, they've lied, lied in, on the systems for you know, uh, months or even years before anyone realized they were there. Um, and, it, and that becomes a question of how much data and which data did they have access to over that time and what did they steal. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about third-party providers. Uh, what you see now is, uh, particularly in the financial services sector, in the healthcare sector, a lot of focus on knowing what your third-party providers uh, are doing for you, what kind of data they're processing for you, and trying to address the risk that it presents to your organization. Um, you know, many organizations underestimate, even small ones, underestimate the number of touch points for highly sensitive or proprietary information that their vendors have, uh, that their vendors have and, and how many there are. Um, most small organizations, and I mean sub-50, well, at least in the financial services space, will have up to, you know, on the average, 27 different touch points. But yet most will estimate that, that the actual number is, is less than half of that. And once they start learning about it, it's, oh, yeah, I forgot about backup. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that accounting provider or software. So, and knowing where those touch points are is important because each of those touch points represents a risk. Effectively, you're buying into their security program with regards to your data. And when you think of it that way, it can be a little frightening. And why is it frightening? Why is it a problem? Well, for starters, vendors may have processes and frameworks that are just not the same as your organization's. You may have everything locked down, but your, you know, your CTO may have it locked down, but yet the pathway for that um, that software entering or the vendor provider's platform entering your organization is controlled separately or not controlled at all. And you need to bring these, these programs in because sometimes it's important from a cost perspective, sometimes it's important from uh, keeping up, uh, or, you know, particularly sometimes there's new, new functionality and you need the new software to, to, to stay competitive. 
Uh, but the problem is that sometimes it's the sales age, sales organization or, or somebody very senior who orders the, the, these products to be or, or indicates or you know, drives these products into the organization. And they may bypass the kind of security that an organization would do with regards to its own products. So this, you know, and sometimes you find these, these um, platforms or software within an organization and there is no real owner at that point. It's operationally managed, but there's no owner of the, of the process. So the, what you, the, the, the solution uh, for this, and, and it, it has to be a solution because you cannot build an information security program without contemplating the full extent of where your sensitive information is being exposed. So the, obviously the best scenario is that you do it at the inception of the agreement. You build it into the contract and you build in, you know, on, on the screen in front of you, you have a number of things that you would typically ask, particularly with regard to personally identifiable information or PII, which is, which we'll talk about a little bit later as to why that's, that designation is significant, but these are some of the things that you would ask for. Um, but don't be intimidated if you have a number of vendors right now and you have already signed your contract and it didn't have any of this, which I think in most cases, that's what's going to happen. So what do you do? Um, first of all, it's important to understand what they do have in place. Even if they're much bigger than you are uh, or you don't have the leverage, it's important to understand what the precautions are. Ask them for their information security program. Review it. Ask them what their policies are and go through it. Ask them what they're doing with your sensitive information. Have those discussions because if they're, particularly with regards, again, to personally identifiable information, if, that, if there is a breach event that's experienced by your vendor, and we'll talk about this later, there are breach notification laws that you have to comply with. And if you don't have access to it, that could be a real problem. So, you know, our view is, is that, you know, no matter how big the provider, if it's an Amazon cloud provider, you still need to understand what their processes are. Whether or not you're going to be able to influence it is another question, but it may, after, after you have some knowledge, it may cause you to move providers, or at the very least, allows you to build your policies around it. Perhaps you don't put as much personally identifiable information in the cloud. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the risks there when we talk more about the cloud. So, but, but when you're addressing a vendor, many of the steps that you take with regard to developing your own program, you're going to be asking those similar questions to the vendor and going through the same process to ascertain what they're doing with your information. Because their program, in, many, in, in, in this case, is going to be your program to the extent that they have that information. And to Eric's point, you know, we've seen a lot of our clients in the past just believe in sort of the strength of a big name or strength in numbers. Uh, a common example we've seen there is sort of Dropbox. Um, we've seen a number of firms just think that moving to a Dropbox type solution is, um, you know, taking care of a lot of issues for them and that Dropbox takes care of backups, for example, um, and it makes, you know, data access uh, across mobile devices and, and home and, and work very simple, easy, convenient. Um, but a lot of them don't understand the security ramifications of something like a Dropbox. And Dropbox, for example, is not HIPAA compliant, and it's not HIPAA compliant for the same reasons uh, that you should have concerns with it, which is that uh, they're not encrypting your data at rest, for example. And these are the types of questions that you really need to ascertain um, and ask all of your providers. Understand how they're protecting that data, as, as Eric mentioned. The ways to do that, um, you know, are actually through due diligence and, and risk assessment, and sometimes it takes technology expertise to help there, but um, sometimes you can just ask for their information security programs and, and try to review that and uh, understand what they're doing. A lot of the times what you need to be asking is specific to their function. So you can't just ask the same questions of everyone. You need to understand, for example, if you have an accounting system um, or evaluation system, how are they testing their code releases? How are they testing that valuation process when they make changes to it? Uh, how, how are you able to test it when they roll it out, for example? Just speaking a little bit about the cloud, um, we wanted to provide a little bit of background on sort of what the cloud is, that demystify that a little bit for everyone on the call, and then talk specifically about some of the security concerns around it. Um, so there's sort of three different uh, general types of cloud services out there uh, to broadly generalize. You'll see infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. And most of you are probably interacting mostly with infrastructure as a service or applications, software as a service. 
infrastructure as a service might be your hosted uh, infrastructure provider, for example. Uh, so they'll be providing servers to you in their hosted platform, maybe storage in their hosted platform. Uh, they, you know, they'll, they'll maybe just have network equipment in your local server room and not much beyond that. That's an infrastructure as a service offering. The idea there is that you've outsourced all the, the management and the, and the uh, expertise that's required to run that service to them. It's in their data centers um, and they take care of things like resiliency and backups and, and management. Software as a service goes a little bit above that in, in the stack and says, you know, we're going to provide the entire application to you without you having to install uh, necessarily any servers locally or app application servers locally or databases locally. It's all going to be managed by that third party. And that obviously makes things very easy for you. You really just either uh, connect via the website or a small application on your own machine that connects out to their servers and they manage everything. Those are probably the two most common things uh, you all are interfacing with out there. What you need to understand, though, is the security concerns around that. So we mentioned, for example, Dropbox. Um, and that, that goes into things like physical security. Dropbox is an example where they, they lack some of those um, protections that one would want to see around physical security. Now, they probably have uh, located in great data centers that have precautions to prevent people from walking in and stealing a hard drive, uh, but what they lack is, it, as, as we mentioned, was the encryption of the files themselves such that if someone were to steal one of their hard drives, they would have that data. They would have your data uh, and you would need to, you would be liable for and all of that data loss. Similarly, we'd want to see things around their, their access controls for their employees. Um, all of the cybersecurity protections they've taken in terms of preventing malware from getting in the firm, preventing employees from walking out with that, um, hardening their infrastructure. And we'll talk about uh, some, some of those protections that you should be taking for your own firm, and that, that'll be exactly the same protections that you want to see them taking. And then there are a lot of concerns around resource sharing in the cloud. And that's not necessarily a cybersecurity concern, uh, but the, at the end of the day, it's a concern for your business function, and that might be that they put you on a shared server with a bunch of their other clients. Um, that server may only have limited resources to function. So in the event that one of their other clients has a big flux of data, for example, you might not be able to operate at the same level that you would expect to be able to operate on their systems. And that also moves into concerns around data security. Do those other clients, um, would, they, would they be able to access your data if they got around the system protection somehow? And what are those system protections that isolate each client? You, you all have a lot of concerns around resiliency, so the architecture of the resiliency, where are they backing things up? What is their recovery point objective and recovery time objective are, are key concerns that you want to uh, understand, and that's in the event that they have an outage, uh, what are you subject to in terms of data loss and system outage time? Um, with regards to incident response, as I mentioned earlier, if you have a breach or they have, I'm sorry, if they have a breach, then you're going to, with regard to your data, per, particularly personally identifiable information, you're going to have notification obligations under almost every single state's laws. And if they don't, if you don't have a process for determining the extent of the breach on their side, um, you may have to notify everybody, which poses all kinds of litigation, reputational, financial risks. Uh, probably a risk you don't want to undertake. So it's important to understand what they're going to do in the event they have a breach. It's also important to understand where your data is housed because your, if your data is offshore, there may be laws in that jurisdiction that prohibit your ability to conduct forensics analysis. There may be different privacy laws applicable to that information that might actually prohibit you from complying with your own. Now in most cases, most of the big providers onshore, you're not going to have that issue, but to the extent you have sort of a newer cloud uh, or, a, or sort of an offshoot that has something very, um, you know, where maybe you're part of an international base, uh, you could run into some, some significant problems. Um, the other thing to remember is that with regard to cloud providers, um, in many cases, just like I talked about the lack of controls with regards to the vendors before, there's actually been a few studies on this recently that found that up to a third of, of both the data and the applications 
both the data and the application separately, it's like 36% and 31%, the CTOs of the organization or the CEOs who's ever managing that function is not aware of that data being there or doesn't know how to get access to that data or doesn't even know that that application is in the cloud. So in effect, it obviously that complicates incident response. It also uh, you know, puts your organization at risk. You know, so to, to, to a large extent, um, having a process for putting things into the cloud, controlling what goes in the cloud is critical. Um, and having a, a, a sure, an understanding of how to get information out of the cloud if you ever change providers is also really important because if it's only going in the cloud and you don't have a backup, you could be exposed on the way out. So transitioning can be very challenging. And on that note, you know, what, a, what a lot of people don't understand is that providers can disappear overnight. And that might be for cybersecurity reasons because they, you know, they got taken out by um, you know, a hacker. Or it could be for financial reasons. A firm just goes bankrupt and shuts down. Um, there was a very common example of Codespaces, which was a technology company where um, a lot of developers out there were using them to host their code. And all of a sudden, one day, a hacker um, infiltrated their systems, deleted all of their systems and their backups, and the business you know, basically went under overnight. And you know, that's obviously a concern for folks using the cloud and that you need to think about what happens if this provider disappears overnight? Do I have a copy of that data? Would I be able to still function without that provider there? Uh, now we have this slide here that goes into sort of a lot of the access controls that we would like to see in cloud providers. Uh, two of the keys here that, that I'm going to point out uh, are that bottom arrow that says encrypted data, data in motion, and that far right one that says encryption on the database, encryption at rest. Those are the two types of encryption, and we talk about this in the white paper that uh, we'll be sending out a link for at the end of this presentation. Those are some, some of the, the precautions that you would want to see on any of your cloud providers, in addition, obviously, to the access controls across the, the spectrum of um, the infrastructure required to host that cloud service. A lot of folks out there switching gears are, are concerned about mobile devices. Uh, so we wanted to spend a little bit of time just talking about ways to protect uh, your own firm uh, while still you know, making uh, the firm's data and, and email convenient on mobile devices. And the solution there is mobile device management. Mobile device management was built specifically to answer this, this problem. It will encrypt the content and the transmission of data to your mobile device um, from your servers or your hosted in an, an IT provider servers. Um, it'll allow for remote deactivates and wiping the work data off of that phone without wiping all of the personal data. And there's different types of services out there. Um, there's fully containerized options. And what that means is that you know, the, the MDM or mobile device solution will will actually sandbox all of the data on the phone into an app. So you'll have a good app or a BlackBerry app. And the contacts, the email, um, all of the, the uh, files and, and the, the data that the firm owns is within that app. That app is encrypted and could be wiped very easily. Um, even things like copying and pasting outside of the app are blocked so that uh, your own employees, for example, can't take data outside of the firm uh, without you know, getting very creative about it. Um, and also with regards to your policies on BYOD, there's a number of considerations. I mean, there's, there's some considerations such as reimbursement policies and whether you uh, provide them to contractors and part-timers. But from, the, from a security perspective, there are costs with supporting a BYOD. There's costs with supporting different platforms, Android, Apple, what have you. There's, there's costs from a security perspective as you try to adapt to the different platforms. Now, if you are in a BYOD environment, bring your own device. You know, in other words, they have their own phone and they receive your data on it. It also has a, has a tendency to change your employees' views on what constitutes acceptable use on desktop versus mobile. So your policies really need to be clear. So for example, and this is one example, half of active users recently interviewed of social networking feel that it is acceptable to upload their vacation pictures that they take on their smartphones on the company server to share with their coworkers, half. Um, and the question is, is how, what else do they think is permissible? Obviously, anytime they're uploading things to the company server, it may seem very benign, but by the same token, what kind of risks is that opposing? What kind of security flaws are, are, is that exposing? So your number one, uh, security risk, 
with regard to bring your own device to work is lost or stolen devices, right? So in, in, in contemplating that, you might want to think about things like geolocation, which you know, may, may not help you that much if you know where something is if somebody's hacking into it, um, or remote wiping capability, particularly if you can limit it to business-related data. Why? Because if you remotely wipe your employees' data, you could be subject to civil or potentially criminal liability under, uh, if you didn't get prior authorization to do so. So there's a number of privacy laws that will require you to get your employees' consent for a number of protective measures that could involve their personal use. So you need to identify what your policies have to do if they lose their device. Um, and of course, remember, you can only remotely uh, wipe a device if it's on. So in other words, it only takes out the chip. They can now download that data, and obviously the chip itself cannot be remotely wiped. Second major threat, malware. Android might be a little more subject to it because of the nature of its platform than like an Apple, but insecure mobile devices is one of the top four causes of loss or theft of corporate data. Family and friends, employees tend to trust their own circles, and they leave their personal devices around them. This should be addressed in your policy. The cloud, as we discussed. Some employees will actually store company information in their own personal clouds, and, these, and, and that information is actually subjected to enhanced protection from the Stored Communications Act. So if it's so, you know, again, that goes to the importance of encryption and the importance of being very clear in your policy. Uh, number five, breach notification laws and obligations. You know, does your policy sufficient protect, sufficiently protect the personally identifiable information of your clients? You know, if you're allowing uh, your employees to upload spreadsheets and, and, and the like from mobile device, you have to consider: Are you could you be potentially breaching? Um, some of these breach notification laws. I mean, certain states have very restrictive laws with regards to what you can do with the data of their residents. Massachusetts, California, Texas, you know, they all have they all have requirements that you may have that you have to adhere to if you are accessing and utilizing their residents' personally identifiable information. Most of which you can accomplish with an information security program. But if you have access, if, you're, if you have the personally identifiable information of those uh, residents and those in other jurisdictions, you need to consider your obligations. Think about for a BYOD policy what it means from e-discovery. Um, you know, if you get a litigation request or a hold request, can you track where the company data is stored? Um, trade secret protections. You should make sure that your bring your own device policy restates your confidentiality policies around trade secrets. If you fail to do so, you may not be taking reasonable measures to protect. And that could ultimately impact your ability to enforce trade secret laws protecting your own information. So these are some, uh, some important policy considerations when you're, when you're crafting a BYOD policy. And the fact of the matter is, because of the nature of this, it can get incredibly complex. There's a number of different considerations under labor laws, privacy laws uh, that are state and federal. So um, it's important to be smart and take bring your own device to work uh, uh, policies very seriously. So what are, what are some of the solutions for your firm in, in terms of uh, protecting against you know, the cybersecurity threat and this expanding technology um, issue, technology risk issue? And here we have listed a, a few of them, and we'll talk about them in a little bit more detail, uh, each of these specifically. Uh, so with regards to an information security program, um, there are some key considerations here, and they're actually outlined even more uh, in more detail in the white paper. But this is just a sort of a broad way to look at it, right? So you start off with identification. I, as an attorney, I go crazy when people, when lawyers are out there sort of hawking uh, policies and procedures that basically say, implement this and you'll be fine. No, it's a process that you have to identify, and it really needs to be customized for your firm uh, if, if you have any chance of actually complying with it. So you first have to, well, what is it that you're protecting? What is the value that you're protecting? What applications process confidential information? Which ones don't? What is confidential information and what's not? You have to figure out who's making the decision and who's responsible for doing it. You know, any, any management uh, uh, guru will tell you, you've got to make sure that you have people who are bought in, your, ma your, your management, the board, up, up and down the organization. There has to be awareness. Then conduct a, a, an assessment. And I say independently assess. Uh, it's no secret that I work a, a great deal with Raj because um, my, you know, in advance of meeting him uh, and, and his organization, my view is, you cannot have the people who are providing your solutions be the one to assess the security risk inherent in them. There's a bias. 
There's a bias within your own organization by the people who are charged with protecting security. You need an objective assessment. You need one that's not tied to a solution on the other end. So you need to find a way to ensure that you get that independent assessment. And the assessment should look at things like what are, what's, what are the threats and the likelihood of them. You have to understand the likelihood. It's not just about eliminating all threats. What is the impact? If you have, if, if the breach impact is very low and the threat's very high, maybe that's maybe that's not as important as a, a a threat being very very low, but the breach impact being very high. And of course, don't forget the vendors. Analyze, fill your gaps, focus on what function you have to develop, the activity that that goes to that function, and your capabilities to do it. Now, these last three bullet points, I don't mean to skim over them. But again, they're going to be unique to your organization. But you need to plan it, you need to build it, and as part of building it, you need to make sure that you build in equity, uh, equity. You need to build in education so that everybody knows what they have to do underneath this, and you have to test it periodically. Even if you do like a dry run sandbox, uh, sort of a feigned uh, breach incident, if you don't have some sort of way of testing what you're doing, you're not going to know whether or not it works when you really need it to. So a lot of this goes into you know the policies as Eric mentioned, and there's a lot of them around the in the information security program, mm -hmm. uh, the information security policy, policy itself. But what a lot of firms generally lack is the incident response policy, the acceptable use policies, the employee termination checklist, data destruction policies, and all of these will outline uh, ways to either mitigate your risk or to deal with the, a breach when it does happen. An incident response policy, as an example, should deal with uh, who would be conducting the forensic analysis, and what legal counsel would you reach out to to guide you through the state notification, the privacy notification laws that are out there, uh, so that you can tell your client in the mandated amount of time. Uh, as soon as there's a breach, most people don't realize that a clock starts ticking on notification. So you only have a certain number of days, depending on which states uh, you, you operate in and your clients uh, live in to notify them, and that's, a, that's why having your forensics team and your lawyer lined up uh, will help you uh, dramatically in, in mitigating the amount of exposure that your firm faces after an event. Things like an employee termination checklist are uh, hugely important because there's been sort of this, this uh, plethora of systems that have entered firms you know, because of the cloud, and understanding who has what access to what systems and what needs to be turned off so that they don't maintain their access to your data um, is very important as well. A key piece of what folks need to be doing is um, institutionalizing their infrastructure, we like to say. And that means that you need to take a number of precautions, um, take a number of steps on the infrastructure side to reduce the, the likelihood of an attack. And that could be things like locking down your network, so ensuring that you have the right firewalls in place, that you have the right access controls in place, uh, do you have an intrusion detection system, for example? Uh, data security-wise, are you encrypting uh, the firm's laptops or, or remote devices? Are you encrypting the physical drives? Um, you have things like malware prevention. How are, you, how are you detecting and preventing malware from getting in the firm, uh, whether it be through web browsing or, or through emails, things like that? And of course, resiliency and monitoring are very important. So what do you do in the event that there is a breach, and how would you even detect that breach? Education and awareness are extremely important. Um, so how are you training your staff to, for example, detect forged emails? And that might be via uh, you know, phishing tests for the staff and then utilizing that in a training session. Um, as is awareness, so making sure that you're aware of the cyber th cybersecurity threats that face your firm. And that could be things like um, utilizing a third party to get updates and notifications of, of the threats that are active and out there. Um, and those will generally have connections into uh, other partners and law enforcement. So we, we, for example, provide that for our clients. Oh, back over. Sorry, we're at, uh, there we go. Um, sorry about that. So the last two things that, that I wanted to mention on sort of how to protect your firm, um, I put together because they often get confused, and that's network testing and the risk assessments. Network testing is important to do, don't get me wrong. Um, but it's very different than a risk assessment. A network test will basically take the point of view of a hacker in Russia trying to break into your firm. Can they walk through your firewall? Do you still have heart bleed out there? Um, all sorts of, you know, the basic tests of uh, infiltrating from the outside. 
An internal network test will scan for vulnerabilities inside your firm. So as we mentioned before, APTs will try to spread throughout your organization through unpatched software, default passwords, um, vulnerabilities that are known out there. And an internal network test will take the perspective of that APT trying to spread and see what's, what's available to it. That's in contrast to the, the risk assessment. The risk assessment is actually more of a process procedure review in addition to the network testing. It will run through your vendors, your, it will do your due diligence, it will run through the control deficiencies and pro provide a report that prioritizes high, medium, and low issues for your firm to address on uh, a governance, a policy control basis in addition to just network fixes and, and remedies. So with regards to breach response, um, it's, it's important to remember that at some point everybody on this call either has or is going to be hacked. And your objective is to do everything you can to protect the 99% to protect 99%, but acknowledge the fact that there will be a 1% that gets in and have a response for that. It's very critical. It's hard to it's hard to um, you're not going to be able to respond effectively to a breach unless you have some some preparedness in advance. Uh, that involves doing some pre-breach planning and understanding what everybody has to do in the event of a breach. Um, for example, if your system securities have been breached, you have to act quickly in order to limit the damage. But if personally identifiable information has been disclosed, you're going to have obligations under state law. And you're going to have to notify people, particularly the impacted parties. Knowing what these laws are now will enable you to better prepare if indeed your information has been compromised. What might not be clear to everyone is when these obligations kick in. Over disclosing the breach is going to expose your organization to lawsuit, loss of business confidence, and telegraph a system's weakness. So what's key is in the event of a breach, and even prior to a breach, just to make sure you know who you're going to go to, is knowing who your counsel and your forensics team is going to be to determine these laws. These, these determinations are going to be, is an author, unauthorized party able to access, acquire, misuse, or able to disclose personally identifiable information? And then there's secondary inquiries which follow from that. That is why a forensics team is critical. So when, as soon as it happens, you have to seek for, uh, expert advice. Once you, do, once you find that you've been compromised, and this is important, the first objective is to freeze the threat and protect uh, other devices. The second objective is to fix the problem, right? So the first is to freeze, not to fix right away. This means identify all the de devices that require remediation and streamline your response across all the endpoints. You secure all data and systems, but also isolate and preserve the compromised data. Now what does this mean? This means that if you have a breach of systems that process personally identifiable information, if you wipe your data, you are not going to be able to conduct the forensics, which means you're going to have to notify everybody, and you're going to have a very difficult time responding as to what happened, why it happened, particularly if some of the uh, state AG's office uh, c come after you. And they do, you know, the state attorney generals can be very active on this. So those servers, take them out of the network, but try to leave everything intact. Keep the power on, don't wipe the data. You know, identify the different types of compromised data, who's affected, the scope of the breach. Try to retrieve or neutralize compromised data, which is easier said than done. Obviously, change your encryption keys and passwords immediately. Um, but very quickly, identify the time frame for who needs to be contacted and how. Of course, make sure doing, during all this process, you document. You know, once a breach happens, you know, it's, it's, things can be kind of chaotic. But it's important to realize that the state, even pursuant to a lawsuit, there may be a number of parties that question your response to a breach later on and whether or not you did sufficient things to protect it and to prevent it. If you don't document it, if you do things like wipe all the data off your network, you're just exposing yourself to a lot more potential damage. So it's important to act quickly, but also very smart. At the, after you've contacted counsel and your forensics uh, team, then you reach out to the FBI if you think that there's criminal activity involved. Um, so in summary, I'm going to leave a little bit. Oh, so um, and, and of course, important in all of this is to is to think in terms of this as being a, a risk management exercise. There's the there's the that damage that you suffer. There's the damage that third party suffers. There's the damage 
professionally, as far as what it means for your business, there's a liability, there's the expenses associated with reach, you know, with complying with reach notification laws. Um, all these things can uh, impose cost and risk on an organization, and, and if you're subject to them, uh, sorry about that. And if you're subject to them, it may be uh, it, it may be a, a significant cost. And for that reason, um, you know, both on this call because it is an applicant, but also when I'm not on this call, I recommend that firms seriously consider uh, cybersecurity insurance because you may be misallocating or misappreciating, not appreciating sufficiently, the amount of cost that could be associated with a breach on your organization. Um, so, in, uh, so once again, I, I think I, uh, we talked a little bit about the incident response. 47 states have identity protection statutes. The state attorney generals uh, actively enforce. Massachusetts is particularly tough. So if you have information from uh, Massachusetts residents, uh, you, you, you probably need to, to, to make sure that you've got at least an ISP in, in place that appropriately protects that information and appropriateness will determine on the situation. Um, so in summary, uh, and we're going to summarize quickly so we can get to some of these questions, but uh, number one, important to remember, uh, threats are becoming more common, they're more advanced, and they are targeting smaller organizations as they get more efficient at sort of mining the results of their, their malicious uh, efforts. Um, there's data everywhere. Data in places that you may not even be considering, uh, and vendor risks are indeed critical. Uh, firms, you, you know, essentially a cost of doing business is continuing to invest in technology and also technology security um, because incidents can be very costly. Um, but if you take the right steps now, you have an independent risk assessment so you understand where your risks are, it's going to help you both avoid those risks and potentially uh, protect you against some of the um, potential litigation that might result if in fact you have one and somebody basically says you, you know you didn't have adequate measures to protect your security. So with that, um, you know you can use the uh, the, the message uh, function, uh, text messaging to send us some questions. We already have some uh, uh, up. Uh, the first one, I'm going to read it, uh, is a specific question regarding uh, safe encryption software. Do you have any uh, so uh, it looks like someone's asking specifically about Folder Lock 7. I've not come across Folder Lock 7 myself, um, but I'm happy to have our team take a look at it and get back to you. So uh, whoever did ask that, please just email info at uponxft.com and uh, we'll definitely let you know our thoughts about that. Uh, the next question relates to HIPAA compliance for uh, Office 365 and Google for Business. Uh, so. Certain cloud providers are HIPAA compliant. Office 365, for example, I believe is. Uh, Google for Business, I'm not sure about. Uh, but you'll be able to tell by looking at their site. They'll generally uh, you know, count the fact that they're HIPAA compliant. One thing that we'd like to stress, though, is that just because they're HIPAA compliant does not mean that they have all of the precautions in place that you would want or that you need. Um, and things like, two-factor authentication and certain other things are still your own responsibility and those are things that you should be doing to protect that, that account and that data. Um, so it's not entirely um, something that they need to be doing. Some of the responsibility still, still lies with your own firm. So the next question, which I'll take, uh, relates to, um, uh, I guess, the suggestion that perhaps you should, with regards to cloud providers, uh, have second thoughts about uh, cloud providers that store the data offshore. Um, and the, the particular point was is that the U.S. government's prying eyes could, could get, a, get a hold of the data onshore. Um, you know, there are certain um, cloud providers, like I think a Spider Oak is one of them. They're based in, they have extremely, very secure. In fact, if you lose your password, you're in trouble because no one there has it. Um, but, you know, it, the, the, the question really goes to how do you conduct forensics and what laws are going to prohibit you from conducting uh, the forensics that you need. Your, your obligations under U.S. law may not be, uh, may conflict with the laws of another jurisdiction. And if you're going to use an offshore uh, cloud provider platform and you're going to send PII there, you really need to understand um, what the laws uh, are there because while in theory, I guess, the, the U.S. government may have more ability to get a hold of the data that's onshore, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that if there is a breach, 
you have obligations under state law. So while you may have avoided the prying eyes of the U.S. government, um, on the other hand, you may also not be able to comply with the laws of the U.S. So that could also pose a problem. The next question is talking more about how to encrypt data being sent back and forth, uh, encryption in motion versus um, encryption at rest. Raj? Yep, and that will actually depend on how that data is being transferred. Um, but if you think about the case of a website as a simple example, you'll want to look for that HTTPS, and that S means that it's using SSL, which is secure socket layers and employing encryption in motion. Um, encryption at rest, in contrast, is um, you know where it's, it's encrypting the actual file on your hard drive or the, you know, the record in the database. Okay, so with that, um, oh, I just got another question. Um, my, my broker dealer affiliate is pretty much endorsing the idea that cloud storage is safer than local storage. Do you agree? I think, you know, I'm always concerned about very generic statements like that. Uh, there is a strong argument that Amazon and Google and the like, they have, they presumably they've invested more in information security than a small organization would. Having said that, they are also a major trophy for a hacker to get a hold of. Um, there's a lot of data there. So they're bigger, they are, they're better, but they're also more of a target. Um, and better is really a question of definition. It's important to understand how you're going to migrate away from a cloud provider. It's important to understand what happens with your data, what the forensics is. There's a number of questions that are very specific to a cloud provider. So local storage, it's a question of what you have in local storage. I'll tell you local storage is generally more expensive. Um, but you know, I've seen some firms, particularly when they lack the management function with regard to cloud provision. In other words, they, you know, meaning if you have a management function that knows what applications you're putting on the cloud, what happens to that data, they fully mapped what is involved and understand all the implications, um, then I'd say you're, you're probably in a, in a better situation to kind of consider using it for PII. What I've seen work better uh, in many cases is putting uh, applications and data that does not involve personally identifiable information on the cloud and really being thoughtful when it comes to the PII because the PII is where you have the most amount of risk in the event of a breach and the need to conduct forensics. So certainly leverage it uh, based on sensitivity, but when you start dealing with very sensitive information, you have to go through the process. You really, it doesn't matter who it is. Um, it's not just security, it's your ability to determine what happened to that data if something goes wrong. Um, and we got a question about recommending encryption malware cloud programs. Um, for that, you know, that's something that we can obviously talk about. Uh, that's part of what we do in our advisory for, for our clients. I'll throw one out there as an example. Um, if you look at WALA, W-U-A-L-A, the lesser known but uh, very secure cloud storage uh, site that I use personally. Uh, I don't use it, we obviously don't use it for our work data, but for my personal data I do use uh, Wallet. Uh, one of the slides mentions best practices, policies, portal usage. Uh, well, portal usage very much goes to, um, you know, sort of, again, raises a lot of the same issues regarding the cloud. Um, so I, I think uh, you know what we were talking about for the cloud also equally applies to how you would use a, a, a portal. Yep. So if any of your vendors, your service providers host portals on your behalf, um, even if your infrastructure provider hosts a portal on your behalf, there's a lot of your data behind that portal. There's a username and password that exposes access to to all that data. Um, so it's a matter of understanding all the all the same protections that you would want to understand for someone. Uh, hosting a cloud service. Although the visibility, and this gets back to my point before, um, is your data, you know, do you understand what data they have? Because if it's, you know, if, if, you, if, if, if you are going to be deemed to actually have that data, they're acting on your behalf, so if there's a breach, you're responsible. You need to understand what is going in the portal. You need to have visibility. You know, you really need to have your hands around what's going on there. And again, I think that's, that's, a, that's a risk I see with the cloud, is people like to use the cloud but they don't fully, they don't have a cloud management program. They may not have a vendor management program, and using a cloud without a vendor management program, particularly tailored to the cloud, again, can be problematic. You need to understand that by putting in the cloud, you're losing a number of things that you can gain, that you can retain, but you need to be very thoughtful about how you're using it. Uh, any opinions on Citrix 
share file portal applications. Um, so that depends a little bit on firm policy and what your firm, um, how your firm wants to protect its data. So Citrix file share can expose all of your firm's data to your employees at home. Uh, that could be a great option for making you know, convenient accessibility. Um, but it does also mean that your employees will be able to download that data to their home computers. And when they leave your firm, they could still potentially have that data. So it's a policy issue more than a, a security, a, a, an actual security issue. All right. So we're, we're, we're being, we have some more questions, but we're also, the time is up. Um, so certainly, uh, you know, Raj and I would love to hear from you. Feel free to contact us with the questions. Um, you know, this was, uh, I hope you found this valuable. You know, Raj and I, were, we're happy to be able to reach out to, to NAPLI's uh, base on this. Um, and, and thank you very much. Um, does NAPLI have anything to add? Yes, uh, Stephen here. Just would like to uh, remind everyone that uh, the recording will be sent along to you soon. Um, and we invite participants to reach out with thoughts or questions to Raj, to Ken, uh, Eric, and myself at NAPLIA. Also, you can download um, the white paper uh, on the screen now. You see the, uh, the link. And be sure to use uh, the password NAPLIA Cyber uh, 2014. I'd like to thank everybody for participating uh, and being a part of uh, the webinar today. And I'd certainly like to thank uh, Eric and Raj for uh, all the wonderful information and content that you provided. Yep, and thanks everyone for joining, and, and we look forward to speaking with, with all of you and, and lending some more insights when we can, and thanks to Steve and the NAPLIA team for organizing. Yes, thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks, gentlemen.